there you are hi so i'm listening to you because i've been here but oh. but not did did manage to get the request through and i'm listening to all the names of all the people who are joining from <laughs> over the country and all over the world and thinking isn't it cool to have this many people joining in these communities that are looking to raise each other up and to protect democracy it's just a wonderful thing isn't that and I, thank you for saying that heather i couldn't agree with you more i was trying to convey that i hope they're coming also to listen to your sage counsel your wise advice but i love that because it always gives me hope when i come on something like this and i see so many people from everywhere who are kind, good-hearted, want to move humanity forward, and as you say, want to be involved in our democracy. So thank you uh, for taking the time. I know you're in the middle of a book tour. Congratulations. Your book is on the New York Times bestseller list. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Well, well, thank you, but but again, I, I think it's a symbol of the community. I, I had the, the pl pleasure of holding the pen or typing, but questions and comments and ideas that we as a community have come up with over the past four years. I learned a, a lot writing the book and, uh, and feel like it's been a real journey with a bunch of people, not just with me. Yeah. So Heather, this kind of moment we're being told is unprecedented in our democracy, right? First time a speaker has been ousted. We have a former president on trial. What do you make of this moment in our history right now? You wrote yesterday, I think it was, that eight people could kind of cause this um, incredible moment, this constitutional crisis, for lack of a better word. Well, yes, it, it is an unprecedented moment. And I'll address that for a minute. But, you know, I was sitting here today, I'm in California, looking out the window and thinking, what? Like, how did we get here? I mean, yeah. isn't there this moment say, this is not okay? It is not okay to have eight people be able to shut down the government of you know one of the world's superpowers. Yeah. So I, I think we're in at this moment, and the idea of eight people who have themselves never managed to put forward any kind of legislation that went into law, who are looking at putting in place a Speaker of the House who is boasting of the best legislation that they have passed being legislation that didn't go into law. And you know we're in this very specific moment, but the larger picture is we have, to some extent, lost our democracy in favor of a small political minority that is trying to d dictate to the rest of us. And that is really the story of our age. Right, but when you say, how did we get here? I have people say that to me all day long, every day. Like, how did we get here? What happened? And how do we get out of this mess? So, so how we got here, I think, is in part because of our faith in human nature. I think a lot of us just weren't paying attention because we believed that the guardrails of democracy were going to hold. That is, ever since 1933, we have members from all parties have believed that the government had a role to play regulating business so it didn't get out of control, providing a basic social safety net like Social Security and Medicare. In investing in infrastructure like our roads and bridges and protecting civil rights so that states couldn't say that you get worse rights than anybody else does because of the color of your skin or your gender or your class. And we just sort of thought that was going to stay in place. And we still know that most Americans, by a large majority, expect and want that kind of government to continue. And I think we just didn't think it was really going to be challenged. How often do you hear, oh, they're not really coming for Social Security, yeah. even though it's in writing? So I think we weren't paying close enough attention and expecting that those guardrails would hold. And when that happened, we gave up the crucial nodes of our democracy to a political minority that is weaponizing that against the majority of us. Now, the real question, I think, is, well, when you just asked, how do we get it back? Yeah. And the answer is that we get involved. And we get involved not only in the voting and the giving money the way that everybody talks about, but the way I think you change society is by putting skin in the game, picking up oxygen and saying to people, no, you know, I don't want a government where eight people can shut down the government. I don't want a government that's going to dictate what my children can or can't read in public schools. I don't want a government. And you can fill in that last line yourself. It doesn't have to be the you or I would put in on it. But it says, I'm going to get involved and I'm going to make sure this government reflects my values, not those of people who don't share them. I've read uh, Heather.
Well, you said a democracy only works when everybody's involved in the democracy, right? And yet we have so many people who are saying right now, like, there's nothing I can do. If eight people can hold the government or stop the government, what can I do? I'm in California, I'm in Arizona, I'm in Seattle. What can I do that's actually really going to make any difference to these people? Well, I kind of love that argument because if you look at book banning for in the schools, we now know that although those book bans got very large play across the country as part of a movement, in fact, most of them were, most of the challenges to books in schools were by literally a handful of people. In one, in one state, as few as two, two, not 2,000, not 20,000, two, 11 in another one. So the idea that individuals don't matter, I think, is a way of, uh, of convincing people to strip agency, saying, I can't can't do it. But look at what has happened really since the Dobbs decision of June of 2022, when in fact we got the versus Wade um, from 1973 that, pr that protected the constitutional right to, to reproductive rights. Since then, the backlash to that has been so extraordinary by ordinary people, especially ordinary women, primarily young women who might not have voted in the past, has been such that the Republicans who were really pushing those anti-choice laws and the draconian abortion regulations don't talk about it anymore. They're trying to use new language. They're trying to say, oh, we really didn't mean to be that much against abortion because they recognize that that's not something the American people want. And you that in things like um, like Cl Justice Clarence Thomas recusing himself from a January 6th case the other day yeah. for the first time. And again, that's popular. So if people feel alone, the answer is don't be alone, find a friend, and then find another friend, and then find another friend, and look how many people are following you online. That's a really big community in a, in a country that only has about 331 million people. Several million people is enough to, to change the world. I love those examples you just gave and I hope people take them in because over and over I hear I can't do anything I'm too small I'm alone and Heather just gave really great examples that are happening right now in real time of individual people finding another person and another person and making their voices heard uh, we saw that I think in 2016 people who didn't want to run who never thought about running for office said like I'm in I'm going to go. We see that with people standing up at school meetings, right, saying this is, as you said, not the government that I want or not the government that reflects me. So many people, Heather, say, like, we seem united on these kind of really big issues, but the media or what I'm reading tells us we're hopelessly divided and the government that we have doesn't really reflect the vast majority of us who uh, agree on gun control, who might agree on a woman's right to choose. Is our government uh, archaic in the way we elect people because they don't reflect the majority of us? Those are two wonderful questions that are in a little bit in their own lanes. So in fact, if you look at any kind of statistic, you will see that you're exactly right, that uh, most Americans agree on gun safety laws to the tune of, of around 80%. That's an around, not exactly on. Yeah. Um, they believe in a woman's right to choose for in most or all cases by strong majorities, again, in the 70 percent. We have strong majorities who want us to address climate change. And what you're so so you're correct that we are the vast majority of us remain committed to a government that does those four things that it's done since the 1930s. But it's not reflected in our politics. And the question is, how do we address the fact that our government, the way it is currently set up, is not reflecting our yeah. interests. And that is both a problem that is the need to get people out to vote and to challenge those laws that are suppressing the vote, because they are. You know, if I hear one more time, why aren't black people turning out to vote, my head's going to explode, because the reason they're not turning out to vote is that they are turning out to vote, but the laws have been written in such a way that they, uh, they discriminate against certain populations of people voting. That's really important. But that being said, there are longer term adjustments that we as a growing nation, and I'm just, I just got to throw this out as a nation with steel frame construction, you know, and that, that came out of nowhere, right? When the framers put together 
like the proportional representation in the House of Representatives, they had no idea we could have cities because until you had steel beginning in 1978, in 1873, you couldn't have buildings that were taller than three stories high because you couldn't build walls that were thick enough. So there are ways in which modern society is requiring that we change our, our system to reflect of modern America. But that's not something that's going to happen before 2024. What needs to happen before 2024 is for people to make their voices heard and to make sure that those voices are reflected in the voting booth and in who's allowed in the voting booth. Are you, somebody said to me, ask Heather Cox Richardson, is there ever been a moment like this in our history that can help guide us in this moment where we have been quote unquote, hopelessly divided, where we had a version of a constitutional crisis, but somehow we found our way forward. Was it a person that helped us? Did a law get passed? Is there anything in history that can guide us in this moment? There is. There's a lot of things, but the piece that I like to look at is the 1850s because, and, and everyone wonders if I'm at, suggesting a civil war and I'm not, and if we have time, I can suggest why this moment is different than that. But the 1850s are very instructive for where we are right now. Because if you had looked at the United States in 1850, you would have recognized that elite enslavers in the American South were had control of the presidency, the Supreme Court, the Senate, and it made inroads in the House of Representatives. And they were very clearly saying they believed that they should have enslavement spread across the United States and then be used as a beacon for the rest of the globe as introducing a new kind of what they call the labor system, but it was one based in race, of course, that would enable humanity to amass wealth at the top and therefore improve through the through the the auspices of those very few very wealthy people in 1853 it looked like their way was absolutely clear and nobody was really paying that much attention because you know it was about politics it was the Whigs and it was the democrats and and whatever so long as your guy got elected it didn't matter so much and then in 1854 they managed to make big enough in the House of Representatives that in fact they made it possible for human enslavement to spread not only in the south but in the west with 1854 People who did not want to spread human enslavement look at each other and said, you know, I disagree with you about immigration. I disagree with you about financing. I disagree with you about internal improvements. But by God, I agree with you that we must not have a system that's based in human enslavement that creates wealth among a very few people who are going to create an, an American oligarchy instead of democracy. By 56, they have started a new political party to stand against those people. By 59, they have a rising lawyer named, named Abraham Lincoln who articulated a new vision of government that helps ordinary people rather than the very wealthy. By 1860, he was elected to the White House. By 1861, he has signed the Emancipation Proclamation and ending human enslavement in America. By 1863, he has given the Gettysburg Address, rededicating the nation to a basis of the, the Declaration of Independence that all people must be treated before the law and have a right to a say in their government. Less than 10 years, we go from the whole world's going to be full of enslavement to the whole world's going to be full of freedom. And the way that happened was a number of amazing people like Abraham but it was really the people on the ground. It was really the people on the ground. Wait a minute, I'm paying attention now and that's not the country I want. And that's what this moment looks like to me. I, I just I just gotta say, that just gave me goosebumps. I just, I, I just wanna say thank you for that kind of knowledge, for that kind of uh, history lesson in such a tight, capsule there. I hope everybody appreciates what you just heard uh, because that's some serious intelligence. That's a deep understanding of our country, our democracy, our history, which I think so many people have lost sight of and track of. Uh, and beautifully put, it was about the people and then a leader uh, who had the courage, right? But it wasn't so often it's just given credit to Lincoln. But what you were just saying is that it was actually the people that woke up, uh, much like this moment, they woke up and said, wait a minute. And then that made way also for the leader. So it was people working kind of simultaneously together. And all of a sudden, everything got changed. It took time. It took time. And we're an impatient world today, right? So people don't really want to spend 10 years maybe creating that change. But that was really such a beautiful 
uh, moment. Finally, I know because you've got to go. Are, are you confident about our democracy? I was reading a piece this morning that said this should tell us all that our democracy is fragile and in trouble. How would you characterize this moment? I think that's correct that our democracy is fragile and in trouble. That being said, you know, obviously people like me every move and and are very concerned. I am very concerned about what's happening in the House right now. I am very concerned about the speakership. I'm very concerned about the government funding that we, it, the clock is ticking. The clock for uh, funding the government runs out shortly before Thanksgiving. And I'm extraordinarily concerned about funding for Ukraine. These are things that, that literally keep me up at night. And yet, we have faced moments in this country in the past that look very similar to where we are today. And it's I believe both in American democracy, which I think is uh, the, the the closest possible government we get to guaranteeing human self-determination. But at the end of the day, that is really my answer. I think that human beings as part of the human project, not just a political project, but the human project, want to have their own destinies. Most most of them, not all of them, but I think most people want to have control over their destinies and want to protect their ability to have a say in their futures. And that ultimately is what democracy and what American democracy is all about. So I do think in the end that the strong men who are trying to rise will fall as all strong men always do. I would just like sooner rather than later so that the damage is as limited as it can possibly be. And, and also, I I think your your incredible warning is that we've the vast majority and I put all of us in this have just taken it for granted that it would work right we kind of got to sleep at the wheel and this is the moment this is the moment not to step further back but to re-engage to find an issue to find a way because if not us right it ends up in the hands of people and we turn around and go like how'd that happen how'd that happen I think that things I'd like to emphasize is that while it's a frightening time, it's also a time of extraordinary creativity. So yes, it is sort of scary to go take, you know, speak at your at your local school board or to run for a local office or do any of the many things that people are doing. But if you think about these times of chaos, like the 1850s or like the 1890s or the 1920s, they are also times of extraordinary invention and of art and of literature and of painting and of new communities and new ways of thinking about the world. So it's not just a question any longer of fighting a holding action, which is what I feel like people of, like me did for a long time when no one was paying attention. Now that tide is moving forward. And so it's not just a question of saying, let's not go back any further. It's saying, wait a minute, I have a special set of skills or I have new ideas and pushing those forward. And that to me is an extraordinarily exciting time as well as the frightening side of it. So this whole thing going on now in the country that is in so many ways so horrifying is also a time of new communities and new friendships and, and new literature and new ways of thinking about the world. I mean, you and I are talking on these little boxes from different continents, you yeah. know, that seizing that joy, I think, is also crucial to this moment. And it's something that people like the ones who follow both of us are really good at. Yeah, I love that so many people are asking for a transcript of this interview. We're going to post it in the Sunday paper. We'll put a transcript. Uh, people say this needs to be shared everywhere. We'll share it. Uh, as I said, um, Heather has got a new book out. Um, it's called Democracy Awakening. You can also follow her on Substack. She writes every day. I, I write once a week and I'm exhausted. You're writing every day. I mean, I'll, at some point, I want to figure out how you do that, how you get that think time, how you get that clarity. I'm always trying to like, leave me alone, I need to think. But you pop this out every single day. Well, it's not to say I'm not tired, but yeah. I have the privilege of having been extraordinarily well trained. And so that really helps a lot. Plus, it's, it's you know, in a funny way, it's like a story that just keeps on going. You know, you don't. <laughs> Like I'm going to say, oh, I don't care what happens today. You know, even if it's not much, you want to know what's the next chapter. So follow her because she, she brings you up to date. She reassures you. She puts it in context. And she reminds us that how important it is to know our history, to be involved. And, um, and she is the best guide teacher that's out there. I don't care what uh, political party you are in. 
uh, I don't care about your age. Please follow her and be reassured and then get involved. Heather Cox Richardson, thank you for taking the time. I hope we can do this again. People have, uh, uh, the comments here are extraordinary and uh, you just gave us all a really good lesson uh, that we need to be reminded not to be asleep at the wheel and to get involved. So thank you so much. Congratulations about the book. Bravo for all the writing and carry on. <laughs> Very much. Thank you. And thank you all so much for listening. Once again, we're going to post this. Heather's going to, you know, go off because she's, as I said, on a book tour. Uh, her book is already on the New York Times bestseller list. But as I said, you can go and buy it and keep it on the New York Times bestseller list. But we'll put this up in the Sunday paper as we try to make sense of this week in our politics, in our democracy. And I hope it will help guide uh, all of us to remind us to get involved uh, and that all is not lost, but all will be if we don't. So thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Heather. Bye-bye.